The Play is the Thing with your host, Judy Sleed. And today's guest, actor, playwright, assistant technical director at Guild Hall. He does everything. He even takes out the trash. Let's find out what else he does. Joe Brando with Judy. Judy, Judy. No, it happens, trust me. I do that with names where I just blank out. Okay, we're having a great time here. Yes. <laughs> Joe and I are having so much fun. We're talking about things that we used to know and all that. Well, anyway, welcome to the plays, the thing. And as I said, I have a wonderful playmate this morning, <laughs> Joe Brando. Thank you. Who is a very talented young man. He works at Guild Hall, and I recently I went there, and his original play, I was witnessing, I went to listen to it. So the name of the play is called The Bluebirds. Yes. So I think we could start with that, Joe. Sure. About your Bluebirds. Well, yeah, it's uh, an original play that I wrote. Yeah. Um, I wrote it this summer, so it's only been about... It's been less than six months from when I first started writing it, and now we're going to have a production in February. And This is what happens when you get inspired. Yes, yeah. exactly. I got inspired, and I was just working pretty much every single day on it. You know, I took a week you know, here and there, but really I was just working, 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 saying the words over and over again, and that really helped me. And what really inspired me was not getting cast in a lot of shows. Uh -huh. It made me feel like I was going nowhere with my life. And I just wanted something to kind of jumpstart my life. That's wonderful. Yeah. I that didn't think that it was going to be this play, um, but I wanted to write a play about a guy who wants something to jumpstart his life. Oh. And that's what I wrote about. And that's kind of worked. And you just, it's, I like what you said that you, you wanted to do something, you wanted to be recognized. And you had to yeah. invent something, but you were in the right place to do it. I was in the right place. Yeah, I work at Guild Hall, yeah. and you know I do all the tech stuff there. I do the lights and the sounds, mm -hmm. make everybody look good, and yeah. you know that really helps when you want to produce because you realize not only what things cost, but you know maybe you don't have to spend money. Maybe you can do it really cheaply yourself. Yeah. So all that yeah. insider information really helps. You know, I did the poster wow. myself. You know, I do graphic right. design, and that yeah. I kind of learned at Guild Hall doing all the different posters and things at different times. I mean, we, now we have a real graphic designer, but uh, before I was doing some of the little uh, posters or little handout flyers. Well, that's great. Which also reminds me that, you know, the expression, the door, somebody knocks on the door, mm -hmm. you have to really listen to it because a lot of people don't hear that opportunity. That's true. And, and, and you did. I've had lots of years of practice of ignoring the door, you yeah. know, of yeah. just wasting time. Um, you know, I, I talk to my wife Jennifer about this all the time, and there's a big question of whether or not you're really wasting time with whatever you're doing. You know, uh -huh. you could be reading comic books, and somebody would be like, oh, that's a waste of time. You know, you should be reading, you know, Steinway or something like that, and you shouldn't be reading comic books. But then one day, you'd be like, oh. I had this great idea for a comic book. Yeah. It could just change your entire life or even other people's lives for what some you people call so a waste. Yes, you are so right. So uh, besides uh, what you said about this bluebird, there is something you want to read maybe to let uh, my, the people who are watching. Oh, sure. Who is watching. Sure. Okay. Uh, yeah, uh, I've got a piece here. Uh, yeah. I'll preface it a little bit. The, the story is a husband and wife. Uh, there's Sarah is the wife, and the, and the husband's name is Walt, and I'm playing yeah. Walt in the production. Yeah. And, you know, I'm still rewriting it now, so it's a, little, it's a little raw. But basically, it all takes place over one night. And they come home from a surprise <laughs> birthday party for Walt, mm -hmm. and he, you know, takes off his bag, he puts his bag on the couch, runs to the bathroom. His wife is annoyed that he puts stuff all over the place. She takes the bag, picks it up. She notices there's a strange weight to the bag, mm -hmm. looks inside, and there's this 
something wrapped in red cloth. And she's, what is this? <laughs> she hears him coming out of the bathroom. She quickly hides the book. She doesn't want to be found out that, that she's you know, looking through his stuff. And then there are some events that happen throughout the play in which she's trying to find out what is this thing wrapped in red cloth? But she doesn't want to ask him outright <laughs> because she was looking through his bag. And she decides, you know, in her own way that she's going to get it out of him. Yeah. So finally, it's out in the open. Well, what is this wrapped in red cloth? It ends up being a book, and a very, very valuable book worth over $100,000. And she really can't compute that. You know, where did this come from? They're, they're not a rich couple. You know, it's kind of like my wife and I. You know, we just get by and we enjoy ourselves, but we're not, you know, outlandishly wealthy, not even close. Mm -hmm. So she needs to know what this book, where did it come from? What's the story? And I'm going to read a monologue, if you'll, okay. if you'll let me. Um, yes. It's, it's a very good play, a good Thank story, you. and well constructed. Thank so you. That's why I don't understand how come you're still rewriting it. Because. <laughs> You go through things, you know, I'm sure you look at old pictures of yourself and you're just like, oh, I wish I could have smiled more in that picture. You know, uh, us artists, you know, we understand because you're a playwright as well. Yeah. You, you look at things that you've done in the past and you think maybe I could have done it differently. And since this yeah. isn't put to bed yet, you know, we still have the production coming up, I can't keep uh, my finger out of it. I just uh, can't. Well, that's good. However, in my opinion, I mean, the way things are, the, the way you find out where it has to be corrected is mm. by doing it yes keep doing it i'm gonna keep doing and, it well okay go ahead all right <laughs> so i have my my page in the book uh my face in the book uh so you just have to deal with that <laughs> so there's this dead guy who used to be alive and used to live in the woods when he was old and his name was albert woodcock clearer yes he was really rich Huge house, whole deal, more money than I could ever make in a lifetime of fixing computers. I ring the doorbell, and a butler answers. A butler in a freaking suit like on TV. I mean, we're, we're in the Hamptons. Who does he think he is, royalty? <laughs> Nobody does that out here. This butler leads me down a hallway, the width of this room, to a private library bigger than this house. There's more mahogany and leather than a Harvard cloakroom. You know the thing about private libraries is they're the opposite of public libraries. They, they don't fill you with wonder and possibility. They're secret tombs where books go to die, to be locked away forever, and just existing inside of this space makes me feel insignificant. All these books, I'll, I'll never get to read all of these books. I'll never read a tenth or a hundredth of these books, not even one. I know this. <sighs> so I start thinking, what am I doing wrong? Why can't I be rich like this guy? I'm not stupid. I mean, he's calling me to fix his computer, right? <laughs> it's sick. All this knowledge and wealth confined to one man. No wife, no kids. It's all just for him. I mean, that's wrong, right? Why not share the wealth, spread it around? Donate it to the libraries of the world. And now I'm getting pissed off. I'll never have the time to read. I'm over 30 now, and what have I done? And I keep thinking about all this stuff I've never done, and it's torture. And then everything stops. I freeze. There it is, mocking me. Wonderful Wizard of Oz. Have you ever read it? You see, I never have. Oh, I started it when I was a kid, but I never finished it. I haven't even really seen the whole movie either because I wanted to read it first. And I've only read a couple of books in school, and even then it just never really happens, just like everything else. And I decide right then and there, I'm going to change things in my life. I'm going to finish what I start. I'm going to do it right now by finishing this. The first thing that I never finished. I mean, it's no coincidence that I have this particular book right here in front of me in this moment. So I take it off the shelf. And I start reading it. And I start sobbing. 
This is it. This is the moment that I've been waiting for my entire life. This is my emerald city. Everything is going to be okay from this point on. Shoot. Footsteps. Somebody's coming into the library. I, I quickly slip the book into my bag. Obviously, I'm not supposed to be just grabbing books off the shelf and reading them like it's my freaking house. It's Woodcock himself. I am so scared that I blurt out, oh, the, the computer seems to be working fine now. Woodcock thanks me profusely, pays me in cash. I'm getting sick from the guilt, and he shows me the door. And, and I finally muster up the courage to tell him about the book, and in the same moment, he slips a crisp $100 bill right into my hand. Uh, what, what, what was I supposed to say at that point? Sheepishly hand him his own book out of my bag? So I just drove home. A coward. Again, status quo. For months, I was too terrified to sleep. Couldn't talk about it. I, I, I Never heard from Woodcock again. About a month ago, I read in the paper that he died. And you know, the funny thing is, I never even fixed his computer. I never even touched it. And that's to be continued. Oh, wow. Well, you did this beautifully. I mean, as an actor, you were wonderful, which Thank I you. told you the time after Thank I'd you. seen it. Thank you. Uh, and the read, this is very, very interesting. And this is a time when you explain to your wife about the book. About the book, about why. Yeah. yeah. And it explains it beautifully. Thank you. All your feelings and everything that happened. And that's why you called it the Bluebirds. <laughs> yeah. Yes. So where did you, uh, where are you from, actually? Right here, East Hampton. You were born? I was born, well, I was born in Southampton Hospital. But yeah, oh. my parents live in East Hampton. They're originally from Queens. Oh. They moved out here right before I was born. So I'm sort of I a boniker. I like that. So that takes a lot of explanation out of the equation. Yeah. <laughs> because a lot of my guests are from elsewhere. Yeah. And I always ask them, how do you end it up here? But I don't have the opportunity you because you're a homegrown boy. No, homegrown boy. homegrown <laughs> boy. And you went to school here. I went to school through the public school, John Marshall Middle School, East wow. Middle School. I went to different colleges. We can talk about that, sort of. Sure. Yeah. Um, after high school, I was really into computers. You know, I was kind of hunched over oh. like this at the keyboard. Oh, so that's from experience. Yeah, a little computer, bit of typing yeah. experience. Uh -huh. And I just really loved computers, and I wanted to be a computer programmer. Oh, that's a great thing to know. It is, except I realized that it's not what I want to do with my life. Yeah. So I ended up going to one school, and then that school closed. So I went to another school. And then I went to Southampton College. And then Southampton College closed. Yeah. And I had to finish up my degree at CW Post. So I've officially closed two schools. Wow. Yes. So what did you major in? Well, first it was computer science. Yeah. And then it was communications with a major in communications. Communications, see, I'm very good at communicating. Communications with a minor in theater and film. Oh, so did yeah. you, through the years you went to school, you've been in plays in school? My first play that I was ever really in outside of, you know, like the elementary school plays was Michael Disher's Follies. Michael oh. Disher taught me how to act, or at least he started to, you know. Uh -huh. It was really bad then. I'm I working on imagine. it now. You, I oh. can't imagine. It was all monotone, I talk like this. Really? So well, it, well, that's exaggerating, but it's pretty close. <laughs> Everything was sort of one note. Uh -huh. And uh, I guess you have no trouble uh, memorizing lines? Oh, memorizing is the worst part. Really? I got to say, yeah. Oh. It's so hard for me to memorize the lines, and I want to get them word perfect. Well, that's what you want to do. That's what I want to do. I, work <laughs> on. I find writing helps the most as you rewrite the lines. And uh, when I was taking classes with Steve Hamilton, he put me onto this book. Uh, I think it was called How to Stop Acting by Tom Guskin. Yes, I'm pretty sure that's what it's called. And he has this method where basically you read the line, 
Um, so let's say the line is theft, lies, marriage. And when you're first learning the text, you read the line, theft, lies, marriage, but you don't say it aloud. You kind of read it, then you put it away, you let it sit in your head for a moment so that it's up there, and then you say it. Uh -huh. And you know, a lot of people just kind of read the lines and say them aloud, but you're kind of just, it's kind of just going in and out. You know, you've heard the term, you know, going in one ear and out the other. It's sort of <laughs> like that. You know, it's just like a hose. Yeah. It goes in and it goes right out. It doesn't really ever sit in your brain. You force yourself to have it sit in your brain and that helps. And I kind of do the same thing with writing because I find myself in a lot of places where I can't say it aloud. Uh -huh. So I will read theft, lies, marriage, keep it in my head, okay, and then I write theft, lies, marriage. Mm. And that's how I do. So I have pages and pages of just the script rewritten, and it sounds crazy, but that's what helps me. Well, that's good. Yeah. Because I can't remember lines. <laughs> it's now, terrible. What have you done to, to, do you have any method to memorize lines? You've done some acting. No, I did very little acting, very little, uh, because I just can't remember lines. So we have the same problem. <laughs> yeah. So, so on your write. next big piece, you're going to do that. You're going <laughs> to write the lines down. Yeah. Call me. OK. I have no trouble writing plays or anything. No, to, you don't to, have any trouble writing. I, I, I guess it's just an innate talent that yeah. I have, because I just, it just comes naturally. Yeah. Because I put myself in that situation, yeah. and then I just write down what I feel at the time or what I think is plausible. Mm -hmm. So you have any siblings? I have two. I have an older sister and a younger sister. My older sister is nine years older than I am, and my younger sister is only one year younger than I am. And are they in the theater? Nope, not at all. No? Not at all. My older sister is a teacher, and I guess you could say that's sort of in the theater, because you're sort of, in a way, performing. Um, you could so, so say she that. has that performance aspect and that communications aspect. And my younger sister works at Southampton Hospital in respiratory care. Oh. So she's not really in the theater. Um, and what about your parents? My mom did some theater work when she was younger and some dancing, but nothing now. And my father is actually a physicist and an engineer. Oh. So, you wow. know, he does some presentations, but he doesn't really perform a lot. So how do they feel about your vocation? They are very encouraging, surprisingly. Yeah. <laughs> I remember, okay, when I left computer science, I said, I want to go be a writer. I want to learn how to write. So they're like, no, you don't. You want to go. <laughs> You're not going to make any money. Go be an actor, which is the yeah. craziest thing that you'll ever have somebody say. Yeah, go into acting to make a lot of money. <laughs> sure, Tom Cruise has a lot of money. Yeah. 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 So that, that's kind of where they pushed me. So they're very supportive of the acting, and they see, you know, dollar signs in it. I, however, do not, but I have found it so fulfilling, you know, acting and writing. I've learned so much about myself, you know, in a way that, you know, I said my acting was really bad and monotone. I mean, I would kind of just, this was me 10 years ago. <laughs> I would just kind of sit like this. Oh. I wouldn't really look you in the eye a lot. Uh -huh. I would kind of talk. I'd be very soft-spoken, and this was me. And because of the acting, you know, it's helped me open up and discover who I am. You know, it hasn't really changed me. It's sort of just amplified me in a way. So did you do any acting at Guildhall? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I've done a lot of readings. I mean, I haven't really done any No, I don't production. mean readings, acting. Oh, like real productions? Yeah. I don't think so. No. I've been trying. I've been auditioning. They haven't yeah. taken me on yet, but oh, I'll really? keep trying. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's, uh, well, reading is good, but then reading you, you don't memorize, you just read. Yeah, and there's a huge difference in that. You know, you, you, I hate being this, you know, like what I did earlier. I hate this. You know, I hate having the book in the hand because it's so, it prevents you from really being in the moment, being in yourself. You know, yeah. it's like I said, you know, it's not coming from your head. It's just kind of going in and out. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I, I agree with that. There's a big difference, but, mm -hmm. you know. I've done some performance. I feel like I have performed in something at Guild Hall without being on book, but I don't know what the heck it is. <laughs> but I've done plenty of readings. So what, uh, do you have any preference? What type of uh, stories you like? Light no. or? I love it all. I mean, yeah, I really love dark, heavy stuff. You know, like you where do. somebody comes in and murders somebody and rips their body into pieces and <laughs> then, you know, throws it out the window and then feeds their dog and then goes get a goes to you get like a burger. You like those type of stories? I like, the crazier it is, the more I like it. 
I'm afraid to ask why. <laughs> I don't know. Well, it's part of that amplifying thing. Like, I would never murder somebody. Mm -hmm. uh, but I might think in my head for a moment when somebody's really screwed me over to be like, oh, I want to kill them. Yeah. So when you're acting on stage, it's that little tiny, oh, I want to kill them, but you would never actually do it. You're just amplifying that to the extreme. <laughs> so the crazier it is, you know, I'm a crazy guy. I'm a really weird, quirky, crazy guy. Anybody who's grown up with me really knows that. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, the, it allows me to be even crazier than I could be in real life and really indulge in killing somebody or loving somebody more. You know, it, it, it's a lot to love somebody and really let yourself go and just be foolish and silly, you know, like a child or in love because you have to strip all that stuff in which you're judging yourself. It's hard to do that in real life. So it's not just about killing people and mutilating them. It's also about loving them, you know, just totally freely. Talking about love. Love. The most important person in your life is your wife. My wife. <laughs> you Jennifer. always, you voice that all the time. I do. I love no her. No matter what you... I'd be nothing without her. <laughs> so she's in the same business as you are. Uh -huh. And you just informed me that you actually never met at Guild Hall. We, we, we didn't initially meet at Guild Hall. Uh, yeah. We met 10 years ago, a little bit over 10 years ago, at Southampton College under yeah. the tutelage of Michael Disher. You know, yeah. She was stage managing in a show. I was in my first show as an actor. Amazingly, I got a lead role uh, mm -hmm. in a musical. And uh. that's how we met. And we didn't start dating so on that show either. you were singing. I was sing singing, yeah. I can sing a little bit. Oh. Oh, yeah. I'm not going to do it for you now, but I can sing a little bit. <laughs> Invite you know, me back. We'll, we'll arrange it. I've written a musical also. Did you know that? No, I didn't. What musical? Well, it's called Georgia Day. Okay. And I wrote all the music. Wow. And the words and the play itself. Yeah. Everything. Did I you do the composition, like the music, or you didn't do the, the music part? You mean part? to write it down? To write the music. You know, well, like the I notes. Well, I tried. But you got someone else? No, I didn't know. Oh, no. I don't. I just have it on... Uh, or DVD, whatever you call mm -hmm. it, and uh, actually it was on those little tapes, in the <laughs> whatever. But anyway, uh, I was just thinking that maybe you'd be interested in that. But what I was going was going to talk about Jennifer. Uh, is everybody does everybody think that you met at Guildhall? Like Most people I did? assume that we met at yeah. Guildhall, but uh -huh. we didn't. And in fact, Jennifer went to start interning at Guildhall. Yeah. And then she left to go get a job in the city. Yeah. And while that happened, mm -hmm. I started working at Guild Hall. You know, I had <laughs> met with their technical director, and he wanted some help moving some stuff around. And during that time, they lost their receptionist. Not their receptionist, their assistant to the executive director. So their receptionist, you know, got bumped up. And I came in. Yeah. And I didn't tell anybody on purpose that we had ever met. Yeah. Uh, because why would I? You know, she wasn't there. But then Jennifer came back. <laughs> and we still didn't tell anyone. You know, we preferred, you know, we weren't lying, but we didn't, you know, offer it up. Hey, we're dating. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, people just kind of found out on their own. They were like, what? They're dating? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. They're fine. They've been dating for many years. Mm -hmm. And uh, I want to, I don't know if you are, first of all, I interviewed uh, Jennifer a few years ago. I remember. Ago, and my very first guest on this show. Josh? Josh Gladstone. I saw clips of that on YouTube. Yeah. <laughs> and I think it was a black yeah. background. Wasn't it a black thing? Yeah, it was, it was different very thing. different yeah. because this uh, Seth, the present CEO, Yes. he did all this because this place looked... We used to have the camera people right here in this room. Mm -hmm. So now everything is out there. But anyway, Josh Gladstone was my very first guest. Amazing. He is. I, I adore him. He's. I think he's, he's extremely so good. talented. Yes. And kind and great. Yes. And I always rave about him to everybody. <laughs> I love him. Yes. So he gives. A, as a matter of fact, when they started the naked stage, mm -hmm. uh, my play was one of the first ones. Was it really? That it was being great. That's an honor. And also, Josh Gladstone told me that they had the most audience with my play. Really? At that time. That's a big honor. Yeah, well, that was many years ago. Yeah. <laughs> so I had, the, I had written three or four plays, and when they all got to be read at Guildhall. That's at very At the impressive. naked stage. I hope to follow in that tradition. And uh, 
I kept telling everybody, don't worry, it's a clean show. It says naked stage. And everybody's <laughs> dressed. Some people were wondering. You know, they would hear and they'd be like, mm, uh, yeah. that might not be for me. Yes. So, um, so now that uh, you're doing this play as not a reading, but as a whole It's production. a full production, yeah. It's a new experience. Right? Yes. You know, people haven't really cast me in any lead roles before, so this is nice to sort of cast myself. But since you're the producer, so it, uh, it, you, you have to deal with a lot of the money and everything else. We are and, fundraising. Uh, well, that's like a whole new field. That's a whole new field because, OK, when we had the reading, it was a very joyous occasion. You know, yeah. I, I love inviting people to free things. You know, it's free, and there's free milk and cookies. <laughs> you know, it was wonderful. <laughs> and now I'm kind of like, uh, now we yeah, can use a little bit of that help. Money, yeah, money, the whole thing, yeah. People have been very generous so far. I mean, it's a very That's tangible great. goal. It's only $7,000. Yeah. And, you know, we've oh, had yes, a lot so of the donations website, So very quickly. The, the website? Yeah. Kickstarter.com. Yeah. Uh, and you search for bluebirds. Or if you want to make it really fast, you can go to joebrondo.com. I have a forwarding link that takes you right there. Uh, okay. And you can always buy tickets at guildhall.org. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Well, I want to thank all my underwriters. I want to thank Lupita for doing my hair and some of the people who uh, contributed to the show. Was the latest is Andy Sabin and Julie Ratner, Steve Spataro, and all the names are going to come up at the end. Nice. And of course, without whom I couldn't do this wonderful show. And thanks, Joe, for coming. Thank you. Sharing. And as I always tell my guests, be ready to sign all the autographs. Oh, sure. <laughs> I've been training my hand. Yes. <laughs> nice. Great. Nothing.